it's, it's really great to be in this, in this session on, on networks uh, because you'll see how, how what is apparently very disparate areas, uh, we actually share um, uh, a way of thinking about these things and uh, language and uh, technology that um, uh, I have been fortunate to become acquainted uh, with and that, that now influences um, uh, the way I think about, about many things. So uh, this is joint work with uh, Michele Cosha, who's here, and Cesar Hidalgo. And uh, at one point, I, I, I always, as uh, Asim, I have this allergy towards uh, uh, coordination and, and so on. We, we hate committee meetings, right? So um, I was uh, interested by this problem of aid coordination. Now, international, the coordination of international development assistance. So let me just, uh, we all know where international development came from. International development came from uh, two phenomena. The first phenomena was the fact that in, there was this enormous increase in inequality across the world. In 1820, uh, the richest country in the world was about four times richer than the poorest country in the world. Uh, 200 years later, uh, the richest country in the world is about 150 times richer than the poorest country in the world. So, <clears throat> by the way, uh, these cool graphics, I'm too old for them. It's all his fault. So, <laughs> so, um, so the idea is that now we have a world that is more unequal, but uh, there's an, another thing that happened in the same 200-year period, is that we went from a world that had very few sovereign states to a world that has many sovereign states. So this inequality in the, between the regions of the world implied inequality across sovereigns. You know, it implied an international governance relationship. So international development assistance is one rich country trying to help a poor country, a state, a rich state helping a poor state, or you know, it crosses international borders, it crosses uh, jurisdictions, uh, governance structures. So, um, uh, we started with very few international development agencies. We started with the Red Cross, it's an older institution, we moved to the UN, the World Bank, but uh, we've seen an enormous uh, proliferation of international development assistance organizations in the same way as we have seen a proliferation of states. Okay, so we have many, many more players on the recipient side and many, many more players uh, that are trying to organize the donor side. So actually, we have something like a tripartite network in which we have donors that try to look, hink, hink, link to countries on issues. And we have an enormous explosion of issues. Uh, we used to think that the development assistance was just giving money to countries and giving education to countries, giving health to countries. Now it's HIV AIDS, it's the environment, it's indigenous rights, it's uh, gender issues. It's, so the number of issues on which development assistance it, it, it cares about has, has exploded. So you have this explosion of players in, in these three dimensions. Okay? So how are they supposed to coordinate? Well, there is a de jure process of coordination that says, we, let's put all the presidents together and let's agree on a set of Millennium Development Goals. So now we agree what the purpose of this is and we have all agreed these are the Millennium Development Goals. And then they tell each country, they say, you go now and write a poverty reduction strategy paper. And you write a poverty reduction strategy paper, and after you have written that paper, you convene a, a consultative group or a round table. And in that consultative group, all the donors come in. Okay, and if you Google, uh, there are 11 million plus pages of round tables associated with aid coordination, okay? Or 1.5 million pages of consultative groups coordinating on development assistance. And if you just Google the word aid coordination, you get 300,000 hits. So it's a huge activity of just putting these people together in this, in this process. So what happens de facto? De facto, this is a process that is unlikely to be organized through this, coordination, through this coordination channel in the same way as the coordination would break down in Asim's example, in the same way as it would break down in, 
on other cases. So what happens de facto? Well, de facto, the problem we have is if we take um, uh, the, hun the 150 largest aid organizations, the 110 poorest countries, and say 30 issues, there's half a million possible connections that you would have to make. But if you say, no, 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 let's coordinate. Let's take two aid coordination agencies. Then you actually have to consider 87 million possible combinations. But if you say, no, let's not make two, let's make three, then in that case, you need to consider 13 billion possible uh, coordinations. Okay? So you see that this thing, this way is going to break down. It's not going to work. It's too complex an area to be done uh, this way. So this is not going to be uh, doable through central planning. The question is, do self-organizing, scale-free networks, okay, can they have something to do with this? Okay? Um, so if you try to do this in a hierarchy, the problem with a hierarchy is that as you try to, as you increase the number of players, as you increase the number of issues, as you increase the number of countries, you're going to get a longer and longer hierarchy so that the, the connection between, say, this node here in the hierarchy and this node here in the hierarchy, these guys would have to go all the way up here and down this way to get a message through. Okay? So this a hierarchy does not have the small world property that uh, Laszlo was talking about. Okay? But in a scale-free network, uh, you don't get this increase in distance. You get this, this ability to connect the network uh, through very small, very short paths if there are some hubs in the network that connect many uh, smaller airports, as he was saying. So central planning is not going to work, and we we believe that then self-organization has a chance to work, but maybe we can help self-organization self-organize, if you allow me the pun. So how would we do that? Um, well, what we did is, uh, and this is why Mikel is so crucial in this, uh, we took Google and we went and uh, crawled uh, the, uh, the World Wide Web, okay? We made a list of 150 aid organizations, including private foundations, bilaterals, multilaterals, and so on. We took the list of the 110 poorest countries. We took an arbitrary list of 35 development issues. And we crawled the web to see which organizations talk about which other organizations, which organizations talk about which issues, which organizations which countries talk about which organizations, which countries talk about which issues, okay? So we develop a measure or a metric of how important is each issue for each country, how important is each issue for each organization, how important is each country for each organization. So here is a network where countries are connected to each other if they tend to talk to the same aid agencies. And this is this is emerging from the data, and what you find here is that the world has structured itself somewhat geographically. Uh, the African countries tend to talk to the same aid organizations. Uh, the Latin American countries talk to more or less the same aid organizations. The East Asia European countries talk to the aid organizations. But the big countries, Mexico, Brazil, China, and India, talk to organizations that tend to, that like big guys, right? So uh, there is some structure that has emerged in the way this aid a, a industry has, has evolved. If you look at the issue a, a map, a, you find that some organizations concentrate on issues such as corruption, human rights, and democracy. A, a, and, and you see how these things are connected. Interestingly enough, a, the aid organizations are all about you know, development, rising incomes, and so on, but they don't really give a hoot about electricity, tourism, transportation, or manufacturing. These things are orphan issues that don't have really a home in the international development uh, community. This is going to be an issue. And this is the network of organizations. Which organizations talk about which other organizations? And this is a very interesting network because it has a scale-free property. Okay? Uh, you have these very big hubs here. So the World Bank is sort of like the premier one. It's a very big hub that connects to many, many other places. Now, 
uh, in the color of these uh, nodes, we put how anthropic they are. That is, how concentrated they are on issues or how diverse are the issues that they talk about. And the point is that the World Bank is an organization that connects to many people, it's highly connected, but it, it does not specialize in any particular issue. It talks about everything. And in some sense, the reason why it can connect to many, many people, it's because it talks about everything. And this goes into a you know, part of the strategy and strategic decisions about the World Bank. They say, well, you know, they should focus, they should concentrate. You cannot be all things to all people. In some sense, they have to be all things to all people because they're playing this systemic role of, uh, of, of connecting. And the same is played by the Save, uh, Save the Children Foundation that connects many other foundations to the issues and so on. So, um, so in some sense, we can connect a country to an issue, a country to an organization, an organization to an issue, but we can also connect, say, a country to an issue by looking at which organizations are connected to the issue that the country cares about. So this is what, it, what are the issues that the country cares about, and what are the organizations that care about the issue that the country cares about, okay? So, so let's tell a story. Let's build an example. This is the case of Bolivia. So suppose in Bolivia I want to know who cares about Bolivia and who cares about microenterprise. Okay? So on the x-axis I have who cares about microenterprise and on the y-axis I have who cares about Bolivia. So if you wanted to know who cares about microenterprise in Bolivia, say, you better talk to these guys who are here. They care about both. But maybe if you don't find anybody who cares about both, maybe you'll find somebody who cares about microenterprise and has not thought about Bolivia, or somebody who cares about Bolivia but has not thought about microenterprise. So you don't have to know, you don't need a, a consultative group and so on, you just look at our website. Uh, now, you uh, might uh, notice here that the International Cooperation and Development Fund is, is very well matched with that issue. If you ask which organizations are related to Bolivia and which organizations are related to the issues that Bolivia cares about, so you sort of match which are my natural partners, who are, which are the organizations that sort of like care about the things I care about, okay? And this is what this graph tells you. This tells you which issues Bolivia cares about and which issues are um, important to the organizations that care about Bolivia. So is there a good match between the issues that Bolivia cares about and the issues that are important to the organizations that care about Bolivia? Okay? And that's, uh, for example, uh, Bolivia cares about microenterprise and the organizations that care about Bolivia also care about microenterprise. Okay? So microenterprise is an issue that for Bolivia is well matched. But there are a bunch of issues, for example, job creation that Bolivia cares about, but the organizations that care about Bolivia don't care about. Okay, so they don't have like assistance in that particular field. So with this, we can generate a ranking of how well matched are organizations between the issues that they care about and the countries that they are operating in. So some, uh, some organizations are well matched in terms of they're caring about the issues that are important for the countries of their operation. And you see the ranking there and the International Cooperation and Development Fund which I mentioned before in the case of Bolivia is well, well matched. But, you know, there are a bunch of organizations that are very poorly matched. Okay? And uh, the, the Belgian, this, there's a Belgian development fund up here somewhere uh, in 19. I, and the other one, there's another Belgian development fund, which is down here. I guess one speaks French and the other one speaks Dutch. But um, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation is, is down here. The, the China Development uh, Bank is, is up there. We can look at which countries are well served and which countries are poorly served. Okay, and we can look at which issues are well, well uh, accommodated so that you know, the, uh, the, uh, the organizations that care about the issue are in the right countries. Uh, but there are a bunch of issues that people care about and the organizations are, uh, th these issues are poorly coordinated. The countries that care about these issues are not being well supplied. So, uh, self-organization is not going to work. I mean, to, for self-organization to work, 
people would need to know who cares about what, who other could care about me, what are the possible matches that you could make in this network. It's an insufficiently connected network. So what, what we want to do is what we want to make self-organization easier. So after we wrote the paper, we've put all this stuff in a website so that all the players in the field can connect to each other more easily by knowing who's doing what, by knowing who cares about what, and so on. So that's, um, that's our story. Thank you very much. <laughs>